All right, this is uh, chapter 10, day one, lesson one. We're gonna be comparing two populations or groups. So what you need is a calculator and a formula sheet as well. The formula sheet, I have it located on classroom and you're gonna be looking at the, the T distribution table, basically for the confidence intervals. This is a long lesson. And like I always say, you wanna stop and you wanna pause as much as possible. <clears throat> I speak pretty slowly, so I hear that people are putting this on one and a half speed because <laughs> I'm so slow, but that's okay. At least we can do that these days, which is wonderful. So I'm trying to be as thorough as I can and get all the thoughts out, okay? So in the previous chapter, chapter nine, we did uh, comparing, uh, we just did one sample test for means and proportions. And we just compared a single proportion or a single mean, a mean to a known fact and said, is there evidence to support something or not? Now we're comparing two populations. This is a little more common. Uh, comparing two populations, you get into things like uh, studies for drug studies. You know, does a vaccine work compared to a placebo? Because the vaccine group and the placebo group are group are two different people okay so if you get into a drug which drug was more effective the drug given to the treatment group or the placebo group so uh, two population or two sample groups are more common we're going to do means and proportions today we're just doing means so let's get started and let's look at this okay so you use a two sample test when you have two distinct populations or samples. They're two separate samples, they're not, they're independent of each other. When they're dependent on each other, that's usually a match pair test. And we're gonna talk about that today as well as we look back at chapter nine when we did a match pair test. All right, so let's review a few things. First of all, you guys know how to get a T-score. That's really easy to do. That's always been the same thing ever since chapter one. The number minus the mean divided by the standard deviation of the square root of n. And this is the confidence interval. This was from chapter nine. Okay, that's from chapter nine. Now, this is our current chapter. It looks a lot more complicated, but it's really not. If you look at this right here, x bar one minus x bar two, all that is, is the average difference between the two. And we're gonna subtract zero because zero represents there is no difference, okay? The standard deviation, if you, in previous chapters on probability, we realized when you combine standard deviations, it's Pythagorean. If you look closely, that's just the Pythagorean theorem. The standard deviation, of the first one squared plus the second one squared, re-square rooted. Of course, it has the sample size in the bottom. Most of that is done with software. And of course, here is gonna be how you do the confidence interval on this. We're gonna be doing both the T-score and the P-value and the confidence interval in all three of these problems, okay? This is gonna be really good. This is gonna be a keeper. All right. Um, zero is the key number because zero means zero difference means they're the same. So if I average 20 points a game and my buddy averages 19.9, that's not much different than, than both being 20, which would be a difference of zero. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do whenever we get a set of data is we're going to ask ourselves, is this a mean or a proportion? Okay, and we're only doing means today. Is it one sample or two? And if it's two, check real quick that it's not a matched pair. And we are gonna have one matched pair today. We're gonna do three different problems, okay? All right, so with the skills you have from the previous chapter, this is gonna be pretty easy. All right, so look at the first one. I'll read it to you here. All right, we got um, a large pet store buys identical species of adult tropical fish from two different suppliers, Byrite Pets and Fish Friends. By the way, I believe this was an AP question many years ago. Several of the managers at the store suspect 
that the fish from fish friends are consistently greater. There's going to be your symbol greater than than the links from byright, okay, or byright is smaller, however you look at it. Random samples of eight adult fish of the byright and ten of the of the same species of fish friends were selected, and the lengths of the fish in inches were recorded as shown in the table. All right, so there we go. Okay. So what you have here, and they've done all the work for you, okay? They've done all this work. There's only one thing you really need to do, and I'll show that, all right? So first of all, you're gonna ask yourself, is this a mean or a proportion concept? Well, we're talking about lengths here, so it's a mean. Is it one sample or two? Well, these are two different samples, okay? One is size eight and one is size 10. By the way, if the sample sizes are different, it would have to be a two sample test because they can't be paired up anyways. Okay, so this is definitely a two sample test. Okay, now we're just going to label this the way it's labeled here. So by rights, I'm going to call mu one and fish friends, we're going to call mu two, just the way the order that it is. And they suspect that fish friends are bigger. If fish friends are bigger, then the by right fish are smaller. Okay. So this is what I've done with my HOHA, okay? Notice there are actually two different ways to write your HOHA. I write it this way, mu one equals mu two, and then HA mu one is less than mu two in this case. But you could put them on the same side and then the zero would appear. All you're doing is subtracting mu two from both sides. You can write it either way. You should be familiar with both methods because you might see a question asked with one or the other methodology. But I would just write it this way. If you want it for your notes, write them both, that might be wise. And then I have the, this in words. I really like writing the situation out in words. I think that's wise to do. Okay, now our assumptions. And our assumptions, I wrote it one way, I would probably do it a different way if I'll show what I'll do. Okay, assume this is the S in spin. We have a representative sample of both by right and fish friends. And the next one, the, this is the 10% rule. I'm assuming you gotta write it in plural because there's two of them. The population size is at least 10N. So there's more than 80 by right fish and more than hundred fish friends. Each fish like independent. Now, I do not have more than 30, so I can't talk about the CLT, but the box plots appear normal. This is what I would do. Let me show you real quick. Uh, if I was doing this problem, I would, I would go ahead and I would type the, them in L1 and L2. And then I would go ahead and make a box plot of them. And if you notice, they're both relatively normal. They're not perfectly normal, but they're relatively normal. And I would draw those pictures out. Uh, what I would do, and please do that on your notes. What I would do is I would do something like this, right? This was by right, okay? And then fish friends was a little different, but it wasn't too bad, it was something like that. And I would say fish friends, and they would say, I would just put the symbol approximately normal. That's what I would do, establish normality, okay? If you have the data, graph it, check that it's normal, okay? So there's step one and step two, pretty easy. Just have to write in plural. Now you got an option here. What do you want to do? Do you want to, do you want to make a confidence interval or do you want to do a p-value? The typical rule is you run a p-value test if it doesn't ask, if it doesn't say what to do. If it says do a confidence interval, then do it. I'm going to do both. Keep in mind, you wouldn't do both on the test. Okay, so on this one, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and punch the numbers in. So let me uh, let me move my face here, and let's let's go ahead and punch. Let's go ahead and draw this out. Okay, so what I would do is I would draw this out. Okay, I believe the if you look back up a little bit, the um, it's 3.4, I have it perfectly right here, 3.46 and 3.40, um, all right? So the typical difference, if I subtract them, 
is, and I'll put that in the middle there. Okay, this is going to be zero. And the typical difference is by right, we're one if they're shorter, is we got negative 0.06. All I did is subtract these two numbers, okay? The standard deviation, now this is how you're gonna write it out. All you're gonna do is you're gonna go 4.34 squared over um, eight plus 0.55 squared over 10. Don't calculate it, but just draw it out. And again, it's Pythagorean. That's all you really have to do, okay? And then you're gonna go to your calculator. Let me slide this down now that I got the data, okay? I'm gonna go to our calculator. I'm just gonna punch the numbers in, okay? So I'm gonna go stat tests, and this is gonna be a two sample t-test, all right? So X bar one was 3.4, it's the by right ones, with the standard deviation of um, 0.434. By the way, I think I drew that wrong. Point, 0.434, there we go, point four, point 0.434 squared, there we go, 0.434. And then the N on this is um, eight. The second one is uh, 3.46, it's a little bigger, not much, they're pretty similar. Standard deviation was 0.55 and it had 10 in the sample. And we're wondering if it's if uh, mu one is less than mu two. The word pooled, okay, pooled is really simple. If the standard deviations are the same, in this case, they're not, but if they were, you would pool the data. And what that does is that will give you 17 degrees of freedom, 10 plus eight minus one as opposed to seven degrees of freedom, which is the smaller sample size minus one. That's an advantage because you're getting a little more accurate data, but typically you don't pool because typically the standard deviations are different. All right, I'm gonna draw this out, okay. There's the box plot still sitting there, kind of cool. All right, as you can see, the T-score, these are really similar. The T-score is negative 0.26, and the P-value is 0.3996. Circle it. It's kind of the answer. Now, that's a fail to reject. Okay, so let me lower this right here. Okay, and as you notice, <clears throat> there's the P-value there. So, but again, I would draw it out this way, just like I got done doing. Okay, draw it out like this. That's a lot better way to do it, okay? So that p-value means, as a review, there's a 39.96% chance we would get data like this even if uh, the fish are the same length. So this difference could be accounted for a chance, okay? So, and so that, of course, is going to be a fail to reject HO, and you'll see my conclusion in a minute, okay? So let me erase this, make sure you get that dialed in. Now let's look at the confidence interval. This one, there's no picture with, so let's check it out, okay? Now I picked 01 as my alpha level. It, the problem didn't state, so I just stated it. So to go back to this, okay, uh, it would be a reject HO because the p-value is greater than alpha. We have insufficient evidence to suggest the fish are different. Okay, that might be something you're familiar with. You should be anyways. All right, for the confidence interval, because I picked 01, follow me on this, because I picked 01 and it's a one-sided test because it was less than only, I'm gonna double 01, make it 02, subtract from 100, I got a 98% confidence interval. 98% confidence interval. All right, now let's, this is gonna be cool. So what you do is you're going to write out, the first step is you're going to write out negative 0.06, which is right here. That's your statistic is the difference. 
Now, this part, I'm going to show you how to get that number in a minute. You might, might remember. And this, of course, is the standard deviation. Literally, what I put, this is what I put in the, um, on the normal curve, OK? How did I get this number? OK, you're going to use the smaller sample size, which is 8. Subtract 1. I got 7 degrees of freedom, OK? 7 degrees of freedom. OK, now, so go to your formula sheet. Your formula sheet. Where is my formula sheet? OK. Um, right there. And 98% right here at 7 degrees of freedom, OK? Notice at the top of 98%, notice up here, the tail says 0.01. That's the alpha level, 01 for a one-sided test. So that kind of helps you. So, so 01, OK? And I'm going to go slide up here until I find there's 01 right there. I'm going to go to 7. There it is right there, 2.998 right there. Notice 98% has a tail of 0.01 because each tail is 0.01, okay? Does that help? I hope. So 2.998, now let me show you another way to do this. If you wanted to on the calculator, it might be easier, okay? I haven't shown you this probably in class. Let's check it out. You're going to go uh, second distribution inverse T, not inverse norm. That's for the Z's. Inverse T. Put the tail down, which was what, 0.01. The tail down, like I showed you. Degrees of freedom, seven. It'll come out a negative number, but it's basically the same answer. There it is. <clears throat> 2.998. Okay. So that's another way to do, which is kind of cool. So two point, it comes out negative the way I do it. There's other ways to do it. So I can go second distribution in inverse T instead of point doing 0.01, I do, I do 0.99, right? That'll give you the positive one. But to be consistent with the table, you can just do that and you get end up getting 2.998. All right, great. <clears throat> okay. And once you got that, of course, we are now right here, OK? And then you can punch that in your calculator. And I'll do that in a second for you. I'll punch that in your calculator. All right, so let's, let's, get, let's get the calculator back up and let's punch it in. <clears throat> so we're going to go stat, tests, and we're going to go um, two sample t interval right there, two sample t interval, OK? And the numbers are already there because the calculator knows that the two sample t tests and the two sample t interval are related. All right. So uh, the confidence level, I got to change that. I want 0.98. And again, 98 because it was alpha 01, which I chose. But I got to double that to make it two sided and then go from there. All right. So there you go. OK, so it comes out something like that. OK. All right. So uh, with that, um, I have a little bit different answer here for some reason. OK, anyhow, is zero in the interval? Yes. And so I wrote that out right here. Fail to reject HO because the interval did capture the because the interval did capture zero. We have insufficient evidence to conclude HA. Just as a reminder, a reminder, we've gone over this. This is a possible type two error, a possible type two error. Fail to reject goes with a possible type two error, meaning the fish could be different in length, but we didn't detect that with this study, okay? Two sample t-test, pretty easy. Let's do another one, okay? This is a cool problem too, I really like this problem. This has a little extra zing to it. So baby walkers are seats hanging from frames they, that allow babies to sit upright with their legs dangling and their feet touching the floor. They're sort of like a little bit of a babysitter kind of a thing. You put them in there and they can't run around, but they, they can kind of walk a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So they have wheels on their legs that allow the infant to propel the walk around the house. If you've seen those, they're often a tray and they'll often eat, they'll eat at it too. So they're kind of wheels and they bounce around, okay? 
Typically, babies use walkers between the ages of four and 11 months. Because most walkers have tray tables in front that block the baby's view of their feet, child psychologists have begun to question whether walkers affect infants' cognitive development. Interesting. One study compared the mental score, I don't know how you get a mental score off an infant, but somehow they do, of a random sample of those who use walkers with the random samples of those who never used walkers. Okay, the skill score for 100 and uh, average 113 for 54 babies who used a walker, standard deviation 12, and 123 for 55 babies who did not use walkers. All right. So the, looking at it right away, the ones that did not use the walkers were 10 points higher. Do you see that? They were 10 points higher. Is there evidence that the mean mental skill score of babies who use walkers is different? Different is not equal to, they're not looking at greater than, less than for some reason. So you think, you think it'd be less what they're looking for, but it's different from the mental skill score of those babies who did not use walkers. All right, fine, okay? So this is what we got, okay? Um, going right off of this. Um, so this is part A, it's a two sample t-test. You're gonna ask yourself the question, is this a mean or a proportion? And clearly it's a mean. We're not talking about percentages at all, it's scores, okay? So I labeled them W and NW. So W is clearly walkers and then NW is no walkers, okay? And again, I wrote it out both ways you could do it. You can do it either way. I write it out this way typically, but once in a while on an exam or some professional paper, you'll see it written out like this, okay? And then I write it out in words too. The word different is definitely not equal to. There is no alpha level, so we're gonna just, we're, we're gonna pick one later. All right, so here are my HOHA, here are my assumptions. And again, you gotta talk in plural. We have a representative sample of both babies who use walkers and those that don't. Those are, that's really important to representative. The population size is at least 10 in. In other words, the 10% rule. I'm sure more than 540 babies use walkers and 550 don't use walkers. And each score is independent. And we do have a large enough sample. So remember this, I love this phrase, the, C on, the CLT or the Central Limit Theorem, theorem Well Ensured Normality. Great, okay? So let's check it out. Let's run the test now, okay? So this is the test that's being run, okay? So real quick, remember the difference was 10 which is 123 and 113. Okay, we put negative 10 because I'm doing it consistent with this, okay? And we're wondering if there's no difference, if it's zero. It looks like there's a difference because 10 points is a difference. And we get a really low T-score and P-value, okay? Let's go ahead and punch this in. So, and I'll just go ahead and draw it out like I would if it, if it was on your calculator. I gotta remember the numbers here, it was, uh, 123 and 13, and then um, 113 had 12. Okay, all right. So I think I think I got this. All right, I'll have to go back to this probably. Okay, so we're gonna go stat, tests, and again, we're running a two sample T test, which I probably passed already. Um, there we go, two sample T test, all right. So the first one is 113 was their average score. And I believe their standard deviation was 12 and their sample size was 54. Let me double check that. 123, 12, and 54. I'm sorry, 113, 12, yeah, 54. And the other one was um, 123 was the mean, 15 was the standard deviation. And then this was, uh, sample size was 55. It's not a match pair because they're two separate groups, by the way, I didn't point that out. Plus one sample size is 54 and one's 55, so they can't be paired up. And then we're wondering, are they different? So there's different, okay. Pooled, no, 
Standard deviations are close, but they're not quite there. And we're going to go ahead and draw this out. I love drawing it instead. It's going to be a very low p-value. Sorry about that. I still have my box plots from the previous problem. <clears throat> OK, so what you're going to do, you're going to put 0 here, negative 10 goes down here. And then you're going to write the t-score and the p-value. And your standard deviation will be 12 squared over 54 plus 15 squared over 55. Just draw it out to make it look good. And then this, by the way, do not write 2e negative 4, right? It's scientific notation there. Write it out correctly, 0 0.0002. Otherwise, you look like your calculator dumping, OK? So you should know how to write that out. Now, of course, that is going to be a reject, excuse me, a reject HO. We have significant evidence that the kids that use walkers and the kids that don't use walkers have a different mental skill score. We have evidence of that, okay, that they're different. Now, remember, the math only shows if they're different. The reason that they're different is up to human interpretation, which is going to be an interesting issue here, okay? All right, so there's that. Now, if you wanted to do the... Um, if you chose to do the confidence interval on this, that would be great, okay? The confidence interval, I have, a, I think I have it written out somewhere. Um, well, actually I didn't write it out in this case, okay? So I guess I won't worry about it in this case. You should be able to do a confidence interval by yourself, but we got that, okay? This is the reject HL. There is sufficient evidence to conclude that the mental skill scores of babies are different for babies who are walkers and those who did not. There is, because you rejected, there is a possible type one error, which would be we, we rejected HO, but in fact, it was true. The fact that there really isn't a difference and we blamed these walkers when we shouldn't have, okay? Pulled them off the market or something, I don't know, okay? I love question B, I love it, okay? This is tough. And this would be something that you would sit around and think about, look at B. Suppose that a study using this design, like this one, found a result that was significant. We did. Would it be reasonable to conclude that using a walker caused it? Boy, oh boy, when you see the word cause, you should be like running for cover. All right. You can attribute cause when you have an experiment. But I don't think this was an experiment. I wrote it down here. This was not an experiment, merely an observational study. Remember, people self-selected whether they put the child in the walker or they didn't. Maybe kids are in a walker because maybe a family has a lot of kids or a working mother or some reason that they can't pay attention to them. So they put them in the walker. So it's possible that kids without a walker are developing mentally, not because of a lack of a walker, but because you're getting more attention. Those are some things you could come up with. But the big thing is kids were not randomly selected to go use a walker or not. They self-selected. So those groups may be inherently different, okay? The difference between an observational study and an experiment cause and you can't establish cause only a link will be attacked on the ap test it is every time okay awesome next problem cpas okay cpas are uh tax preparers they have a stressful job at certain times of the year let's get started okay an accounting firm measures the blood pressure of 10 of its certificated public accountants before and during the spring tax season. The systolic pressure for the 10 individuals designed A through J are as follows. Fine. Is there evidence that the blood pressure of the CPAs rises during tax season? Rises. Rises means increases. That's going to be greater than. All right. You ask yourself first, is this a mean or is this a proportion? It's a mean. However, is it one or two samples? It looks like two, but it's not. This is the same person, person A, person B, person C, etc., 
doing something twice, getting their blood pressure measured before and during the tax season. This is a match pair. So I don't care that this is 115 and 110. I care that the rise is five. This rise is two. This rise is actually a fall, it's negative one. This rise is three. This rise is zero. This rise is four. This rise is one. This rise is three. This rise is actually a fall, it's negative two. And uh, this is one. You're gonna put those numbers into your calculator, which I did, let me show you. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Um, we got all these numbers in here. Okay, that's, that's what I re relate to you. And you're just gonna go stat, calc, one variable stats, and I put it in L3, you might be in L1, but whatever, L3. Hit calculate. And the mean is 1.6, you need this number, and you need the standard deviation 2.221. Okay, that's what you need. So that's not a big difference, right? Zero is the number, is 1.6 a big average increase from zero? Probably not, especially with that fairly large standard deviation. I'm pretty confident we're not gonna get uh, data that's, that's gonna help us in this area. All right, so here we go. Let's draw this out here. Here's HOHA, remember from the last chapter on HOHA, remember. You got to put a sub, mu sub difference, because you're telling everybody this is a t test only, a t test only, but it's a it's a match pair t test, okay? So, uh, and then I wrote right here one sample t test match pair, and I labeled what we're doing. Just communicate. Here's your assumptions, okay? Here's your assumptions. The box plot I think is fairly normal. Let's check out the box plot real quick. So let me go back to the data here. So we're going to go let's see here, stat. No, second y equals, and we're going to turn one of these box plots off. I'll turn that one off. And then we go over to plot two. I'm just going to plot what's in L3. I have it in L3. You probably are putting it in L1, which is more normal. That data is totally normal. <laughs> So we're good to go. That data is completely normal. So what I would do in this case is I would draw this out. Where are we at, right? Um, here's your assumptions. I would draw, excuse me. I would draw this out, okay? And just say approximately normal data, great. It's not over 30, so there's a caution there, but we've got to cover. All right, so that P value is going to come in because it's going to come right here from the calculator, okay? So let me go ahead and run that test on the calculator. I can remember the numbers. All right, so I'm gonna go stat calc, stat tests. I'm gonna run just a T test. Remember that's it's a match pair. So that's one point, it kept it all in there for me, great. And then I'm wondering if it rises during tax season, that's greater than, and hit draw. there you go there's there's your stuff that remember when you're labeling it you're gonna put you know the 2.22 whatever that was of a square root of 10 right and then you're gonna put zero here and this was a 1.6 okay and there's your t score and your p value okay 0.0244 now at the 01 level that's failed to reject i think i went 05 on this just to do it Okay, but again, there's no direction given on that. So you have to just supply the alpha level yourself. So I put um, reject HO with the P value of this, the interval, et cetera. I put two different things. Now on the confidence interval, remember that would be, this is from last chapter. If you did a confidence interval, zero is definitely in the interval, okay? Depending on, if you did a 98, that would be alpha of 01, right? 01. And if you did a 90, that would be alpha of 05. So again, this is that situation where it's between there. Notice I wrote this all out twice 
because at the O1 level, it's fail to reject, and at the O5 level, it is reject. So you have two different ways of writing a conclusion. You can write either way. Notice at the O5 level, zero is not in the interval, but at the O1 level, it is in the interval. So, which makes sense. It's going to be consistent with reject and fail to reject. Okay. So that is chapter um, 10, day one, first day, very long video. Hopefully you, pop, you stopped and paused it. And it does refer back to chapter nine as well. Okay. Good job. See you soon.